Now, the Church of England has officially apologised for its shameful treatment of LGBT plus people. The bishops of the Church of England wrote a letter which admitted that LGBT plus people have at times received a hostile and homophobic response. Here's the Bishop of London, Sarah Mullally. In an open letter, we together apologise for the pain, hostility, exclusion and rejection that LGBTQI people have experienced within the church. We realise that this behaviour has not reflected the universal love of God for all people. We know that we need to change. Sorry, I haven't heard. Well, I'm joined now by Jane Ozan, founder of the Ozan Foundation, which works with religious organisations to end discrimination based on sexuality or gender. Um, this business that the Church of England is going to allow clergy to bless same-sex couples who have legally married, is it, I mean, do you welcome the change or is it a bit of an awkward compromise? Well, it's breadcrumbs, Cathy. I mean, it's not even what we would call a proper blessing. It's some prayers, which uh, one of them has the word bless in it, but it's not a what we call an authorised rite. But if we go back to the apology, you know, we've had apology after apology after apology. One of the first things I did in 2016 was to write with many other senior Anglicans asking for an apology. But apologies only go so far. What, what you need to do is then stop harming. And what's incredulous to me about what's happened today is that we've had a statement from the archbishops apologising, recognising that there is harm that continues in our churches and does nothing to address that harm. I mean, a lot of people are, are, are sort of gobsmacked that um, you still can't, as a gay couple, get married in mm -hmm. a church. Mm -hmm. um, the pace of change seems sometimes glacial, doesn't it? Well, it's snail. I, I, actually, I think a snail's quite fast <laughs> amongst the bishops. By comparison. We did some research with my foundation last year, a YouGov poll, actually, to ask what um, both the public attitude was to same-sex marriage, but also what Anglicans' attitudes were and are. And we, we've done this every, six year, uh, every two years, so we've done it three times. And the pace of change is huge. A majority of Anglicans want same-sex marriage in the church. The one group that didn't want it were Anglican men over the age of 55. And if you think about the makeup of the House yeah. of Bishops, well, I'm afraid it's primarily that. But, but there's also something else as well. I mean, you know, I wonder if you have any sympathy with the Archbishop um, because he's presiding over this church that is split asunder. And whatever he does, he's going to alienate one wing of the church. So he's got to compromise, hasn't he? Well, no, you don't compromise on justice or core Christian values. You know, my, for me, I've been very consistent. We know that church teaching has caused people to take their lives. We've had the ICSA report that's told us that, the Cooper report. Into child the abuse. Of, well, yes, yeah. well, child abuse, but also into uh, Peter Farquhar's death when he was murdered by a chap called Benfield and he was closeted. He didn't feel he could tell anybody uh, that he was gay. And, and so he was, you know, he, he was a, a very vulnerable. And similarly, the terrible... Um, death here in suicide here in London of Father Alan Griffin. All those public reports pointed to the Church of England's culture, but also it's, it's, it's teaching about the way that we deal with sexuality. And it's that that actually I think we have to hold our hands up and admit that we've got this wrong. Mm. And if the Archbishop um, could do anything, I think it would be to stand up for truth. You, we've had to admit things things that we've got wrong in the past you know years and years ago we used to think the world was flat and then we thought women sh you know black people shouldn't get married and that women shouldn't have a role and we've had to recognize that we've we've not treated people justly i mean justin welby the archbishop of canterbury has never made clear his view do you suspect that personally he's on your side or or do you not know i used to think he was but i can't I can't see how he can be, given all the things that he's said and done recently. I mean, his statement today that he himself wouldn't bless us is extraordinary, because if you're going to apologise and say we want to welcome you, that we're going to stand against homophobia, which for me is about standing against discrimination, and then you go on to say, oh, but by the way, you know, this doesn't include me. Hmm. That is not a, an LGBT-friendly thing to say. Yeah. So, um yeah. I mean, do you think in your lifetime that LGBT couples will be allowed to get married in the Church of England, in church? 
I hope so, but I, I think the bigger question is, will there be a Church of England for them to get married in? All right, you think this is an existential crisis? Well, I, I, I think we're imploding. I think, you know, we're becoming almost sex-like, and very. we are not a church for the whole of England, that is clear. We're a church for, for heterosexual <laughs> couples. Um, so we don't serve the whole of England. But I think the younger generation in particular are voting with their feet. Mm. You know, we've seen that in the recent census figures, which showed that... Um, you know, we are now a very secular country. But young people I deal with um, are interested in spirituality. They're interested in Christianity, but they think that the Church of England is a hotbed of hypocrisy, sexual abuse and injustice, and they don't want anything to do with it. Mm. And I'm afraid today's news is just going to back that up. Well, that does rather raise the question of, of whether the Church of England has a right to be the official church uh, anymore. And, you know, the new king has talked in the past about being defender of faith rather than the faith. Well, Is that the way we're going? Well, I think so. I mean, we saw last week uh, um, various MPs go public about the fact they too had written to their bishops. And I'm dealing with a lot of parliamentarians who are also very concerned about the, the, the direction of travel for the Church of England. They want all their constituents to be able to go to their parish church and get married. And that is not the case. You slightly dodged my question, though. It, you know, should the Church of England, does it have any right anymore to be called the official church? I don't should believe it? so. Personally, no. So I, I, I think um, uh, with the news today, uh, they have... I think um, well, I, surrendered I was, the. I was going to say nailed the coffin. You know, I think they really have um, shot themselves completely in the foot. But I think it's it because it is about justice and equality. If the law of the land is that we can marry LGBT people civically, then mm. the established church shouldn't be seeking exemptions from that, should not be seeking exemptions from the Equalities Act, which we currently have, and should be there to serve the whole people of Britain. I mean, it, you know, if the, you know, the high ups in the Church of England were in the studio right now, wouldn't they say, well, you know, you've got your view, but we're, we're trying to hold this thing together. Well, you, they have... you, you go off and form your own church. <laughs> Which, of course, um, has been the answer over the years. That's how we start, uh, started Methodism. But actually, what's happened in the Anglican Communion is there's always been a role for conscience, for moral conscience, and that is not reflected in what the bishops have produced today. There is no role for moral conscience for those clergy who would like to be able to marry LGBT people. Mm. So I, um, I would challenge them straight back, as, as we will in Synod, and say that they are not, uh, I think, delivering a service for all. But more importantly, I, I keep coming back to this question of harm. They are embedding institutional homophobia in such a way that we know it will impact the lives of LGBT people, particularly young LGBT people, and make them feel second best, but also cause them to feel that being gay is sinful and wrong. Um, there's so many stories in, in a similar vein um, concerning sort of traditionalists and, you know, modernizers within this space. Uh, the government has confirmed that uh, a ban on conversion therapy will include trans people. The Equalities Minister appears to be concerned that this might criminalize parents trying to advise their kids uh, if kids are struggling with their identity. Might she have a point? No. Absolutely not. You know, <laughs> parents' rights do not trump children's rights. And if you've got well, any really? doubt whatsoever, that, I mean, you know, no, I... the law is very clear on that. You know, that's why we stopped smacking. You know, if you've got any doubt, go to the Stonewall website. They launched a very powerful video yesterday showing an example of trans religious conversion therapy. And you will see the coercive... Um, nature that I am so familiar with because I deal sadly with a lot of young LGBT people who come talking about the abuse that they're suffering. I think it comes down to what we understand about conversion therapy, um, Cathy. So to be clear, it's anything with a predetermined purpose. So something where your mind is already made up as a parent, as a religious leader, as a, a counsellor, you the person in power has decided that the young person or whoever's in front of you cannot possibly be gay or cannot possibly be trans. And if that's your mindset, you're going to cause harm. Jane Ozan, thank you very much for coming in the studio and talking about many thorny issues facing the church at the moment.